record? Yeah, yeah okay. on the record, yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's get started. It's uh, my name is Shulei Zhan. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce our today's uh, speaker, Professor Ngar Kim. Uh, Professor Kim got her bachelor and master degrees in physics in 1998 and 2000 respectively uh, from Seoul National University. And then she uh, came to US and got her PhD degree in physics from uh, the University of uh, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She did a three year postdoc at Stanford University before she joined the Cornell University as an assistant professor of physics in 2008. She was uh, promoted to a full professor in 2019. Um, professor Kim has also uh, received several prestigious awards, uh, including the John Bading Awards at UIUC, NSF Career Awards, and DOE Early Career Awards. Last year, she was also named as a APS Fellow. Uh, congratulations. So for her, uh, for her broad in, uh, contribution uh, to uh, theoretical condensed matter physics. She has a very uh, uh, variety of research interests in condensed matter physics, including high TC superconductivity, strong quality system, topological matter, et cetera. And uh, today uh, we will learn from uh, Professor King about some pioneer works her group did in using uh, new machine learning tools uh, to advance our understanding of uh, quantum matter data. So without further ado, uh, Ngar, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very happy to be here. Um, so uh, I want to talk about interpreting, interpretable machine learning of quantum emergence. And um, most of a uh, large part of what I will be discussing, you can find in uh, this reference and, and this reference. All right. So. <clears throat> Um, I'm a theorist, uh, but I like to work on, uh, I've always liked to really uh, want, look at experimental data and learn from it. Um, I think in general, the, uh, as a community, we are trying to uh, understand what uh, complex experimental data is trying to tell us. We, we're trying to understand the story uh, in the form of a simple theoretical insight. And we, uh, we get the confirmation that uh, our understanding was meaningful by being able to make the prediction. Now, going back and forth between uh, this uh, understanding and prediction, we, uh, the objective is so that we can understand uh, complex phenomena and how uh, things come together, such as what, why the structure of graphene um, compared to diamond, leads to this kind of different properties, and how does uh, high TC superconductor su superconductors exhibit uh, superconductivity? Now, um, in trying to pursue that connection between data and uh, understanding, what uh, becomes very quickly evident is the information content in material systems. If we only think about the uh, ideal limit of perfect crystal um, with the number of atoms involved and their uh, point group symmetry, the information content is intensive. But once the electronic degree of freedom are taken into account, possibilities of distortions, uh, fluctuations, when all of those are taken into account, the information content becomes extensive and quickly exceeds the, uh, a, a piece of materials would carry with that information content that quickly exceeds total content of information, uh, size of the total content of information in the Library of Congress. And, and um, I believe it is this, uh, our innate under sense of the fact that we're dealing with a large amount of information that really drove uh, revolutionizing data acquisition. Tunneling density of states uh, measured with a macroscopic tunnel junction like this, where you have a uh, uh, insulating barrier separating two uh, superconductors and you apply voltage. From the tunneling conductance, you can um, measure the density of states. And uh, measurements under this kind of macroscopic tunnel junction 
resulted in this curve. In 1962, this beautiful curve uh, gave us a great deal of insight into superconductivity. It tells us the density of state is suppressed and there is a gap as a result. There, we, and then there is a coherence peak. These are very salient features, but not only these very salient features, but also the subtler features such as uh, this little wiggle here and this little wiggle here. These were uh, modeled using BCS theory of superconductivity with phono mediation. And the fact that the theory could account for even these kind of features gave us as a community the confidence that we understand what is going on. But today, we often, in many groups, the density of states are measured as a function of position with subatomic scale resolution. Instead of a macroscopic tunnel junction, we use vacuum as a tunnel junction. We move the tip around, and instead of taking one curve, we'll take um, tens of thousands of curves. And that in, in inevitably, such probing mode of uh, probing uh, microscopes, um, scanning probing microscopes, such as scanning tunneling microscopy, inevitably reveals structure in position, reveals much more information. But we can, you can uh, not find how to guidance on how to take this amount of information and um, pack it back down to something simple in any uh, standard textbooks. X-ray diffraction in 1913, <clears throat> over 100 years ago, um, this image is taken from this Nobel Prize winning work by father and son Bragg and Breck. Um, what they did in this paper was to model three peaks. One, two, three. There are three peaks in uh, the reflection measured as a function of angle as they rotate the sample. They came up with the world's first forward model link of X-ray diffraction. And it was a very successful model. They modeled, if I assume atoms form a form regular structure, and therefore there is a plane of atoms, the distance between the pla two planes would amount to uh, this kind of interference condition, which we now teach in introductory physics as the Bragg condition. They were first able to measure this uh, interatomic spacing by fitting the data they acquired, just the location of the peaks, to this forward model. Now, 100 years later, uh, the technology for uh, acquiring data have improved a great deal. Now, at um, Argonne National Lab and other uh, light sources, you measure not three, four peaks, about 100,000 peaks. So this is an example of, uh, of one such uh, data where you get a distribution in three dimensional space of these intensities. And you can see this intricate structure if you look at a plane. Now, once again, you cannot find uh, any guidance on how to deal with terabytes of data, uh, looking at it to um, extract physically meaningful information. Projective measurements in 1922, uh, this is a plaque uh, remembering um, Stern and Gerlach. This little uh, splitting that's shown here was probing two-dimensional Hilbert space of uh, spin half degree of freedom, single spin half degree of freedom. But projective measurements today uh, for instance, with quantum gas microscopy or in various uh, quantum computing platforms, um, you have you are accessing Hilbert space of not not of one spin, one independent spin, but whole uh, set of qubits that are interacting with each other. So uh, this uh, data revolution that I've been uh, laying out so far gives us 
uh, much more closer to the secrets, presumably, of what's happening in the systems of interest. But uh, what's blocking us is that we don't necessarily know how to connect complex, large volume data to uh, simple theoretical insight. We are only used to working with much simpler type of data. Now, um, how to make a path forward in this uh, sort of uh, uh, this, you know, being too rich with the data and therefore at the same time, you know, having difficulty dealing with it. Um, that with, with that situation, it's uh, useful to recognize trying to understand what's going on in data is really just not, it's not something that physicists have monopoly over. That's uh, what, you know, many people in the real world, the you know, everyday life try to do as well. So um, trying to go from complex data to simple uh, theoretical insight is called regression. And trying to make a prediction for what can happen in the future is called generative modeling. Now, so what uh, my group has been pursuing for the last uh, couple of years is the premise that machine learning tools they have, that have been very successful uh, with the data science tasks, with um, everyday life data, such as images or uh, uh, driving or uh, playing games or recommending music or movies, perhaps some of those tools can help us bridge between the complex and rich and growing volume of data to uh, simple theoretical insight. So uh, the, what we've kind of taken on is a, a role of uh, exploring uh, what, what kind of data problems are there and how, what type of approaches can um, help with those type of data problems. We looked at scanning tunneling spectroscopy on high TC cube rates. This led to our uh, uh, paper on nature. Um, to the best of my knowledge, this was the first paper which actually applied machine learning to quantum matter data, experimental data, and was able to gain meaningful insight from it. Since then, we've looked at resonant ultrasound spectroscopy. Spectroscopies often involve an inverse problem. Uh, if you know the model, you can model what the, what the spectroscopy uh, peaks, where the peaks will appear, what the frequencies will be. But going from frequencies to the model is an inverse problem, just like X-ray problem. We've also looked at um, learning uh, subtle things from computational data uh, of uh, quantum, near quantum critical point between spin density wave and Fermi liquid state. Uh, we looked at using language models on um, tomographic tasks on uh, the experimental data from IBM Q. What I want to talk about today are mostly on uh, XTech, which is an approach for dealing with large volume X ray data. Uh, XTech stands for uh, X ray temperature series clustering, X ray temperature clustering. And uh, also uh, our approach for uh, image-like data, such as quantum gas microscopy. So, uh, but before I go into uh, spe specifics of uh, some of our projects that I wanna showcase, one message that I want to kind of convey based on our experience is uh, the following. Uh, this blender, industrial strength blender, is a great tool for making smoothies if that's your uh, objective. But this more of a stone age tool is perhaps a better tool if your objective is to make guacamole and uh, see all the ingredients and how they are coming together. So the point is, um, your choice and strategy should be really objective driven, driven by what is your data problem and what you're trying to learn. Uh, and just like when we pick a tool, 
at a, a kitchen equipment store or at a, a hardware store, choice of a tool should be always guided by what is the task that we have in mind. Now, that's a general uh, statement for any machine learning for any data science problems. When it comes to physics, there is additional um, constraint or additional point of consideration, which is to think about um, the fact that you're, if you use minimalistic approaches, such as the Stone Age tool, it's more likely you will be able to see what's going on and you can integrate your physics principles and being able to um, articulate what is going on is going to help us bring back whatever we learn into the physics domain and um, get that incorporated into the actual progress. So I want to emphasize the interpretability and also uh, as a corollary, using machine learning doesn't mean you have to rely on black box. So first I want to talk about supervised machine learning on hypothesis testing of quantum image like data. The tunnel density of states that I described. This work was led by uh, my former postdoc Yi Zhang and uh, was a collaboration with uh, Shabas Davis. Um, and you can find the details in this paper. So the question here was which theory best describes the pseudo gap state? Uh, pseudo gap state is uh, an enigmatic state that appears in under the part of the Coupe phase diagram. And many different probes have been applied and many different approaches have been um, taken. Now, I cannot speak for all types of experimental probes of pseudo gap, but I wanted to be at least confident on what we can make of this image that is the STM data of this enigmatic pseudo gap state. And I wanted to be able to connect, we wanted to be able to connect this image, this beautiful image to a definite theoretical hypothesis the best we can um, while being uh, objective. So what are the two um, candidate theories that we can discriminate? Uh, one is the weak coupling picture where the patterns of mod modulations are expected to appear from uh, nesting. The other is a strong coupling picture where the modulations are expected to be uh, promoted by the local aspects of the spins on the copper sites, as well as the spin carried by the holes. Now, you can see that this is drawn in momentum space and the periodicity of modulation would not have any particular relationship with the lattice constant. Because lattice constant gives a really big momentum scale. In this real space starting point, on the other hand, you can see how any, any pattern that you form, any motif you form in the strong coupling picture will be necessarily commensurate to the lattice. So we can translate the question that we're asking, is it, weak coupling picture or strong coupling picture to what is the best motif that describes the data? Is it commensurate with the lattice? Now, when you see a pattern like this, we are not often drawn to, uh, compelled to do a Fourier transform. That's the first thing one would try. Can you get something from Fourier transform? But if you actually do Fourier transform, you get a broad features like this. And it's very evident from this line cut that it, there is this broad feature with kind of jaggedness. It's not just smooth, broad feature that you can just put a center on, but it's all this jaggedness that's making it very difficult to say what is kind of the dominant opinion for this periodicity in the data. Uh, non so uh, these are challenging problems. Often uh, this kind of challenging analysis problem up, uh, show up in uh, dealing with image like data. There are another, there are other problems in sort of a larger world where there's a, a challenges in dealing with complex image like data. Um, traditional computer science worked by 
taking a data and a human programmer writing a program that will manual, although computer will do it, it will follow the man given instruction step by step. So you give that to the data and there will be an output. The trouble is that we don't know uh, necessarily how to go from uh, particular as aspects of the data, image like data to the uh, diagnosis. However, one has uh, the um, trove of data that's labeled uh, images of patients that are proven to have Alzheimer from biopsy and uh, proven to not have Alzheimer's. So the new modality is take the data and output together, we call it label data, give it to computer and let computer try to model what's going on. And then, so computer writes the program and to that computer with the pro computer written program, we give a new data and ask, now given your training, which of these two hypotheses do you think this best resemble? So the question is, can we do the same thing? How does this uh, neural network work? Um, I have two little kids and literally when I was getting into machine learning, I, I had this sense that, you know, I, I was able to train my kids on certain basic tasks. And, you know, I know what it takes to train human. Maybe I can figure out how to train um, computers too. So what the neural network does, like classifier, which is what we're using to analyze the image like data, classifiers works in the following way they try to make a decision. You give data, it's trying to make a decision. Just like this poor kid who has to make a decision after very quickly after having dropped this ice cream. So what does the kid do? The kid will take in various inputs. How long has it been fallen on the ground? How is the, is the mom watching? How sweet is it? Whatever the food that has fallen. And how green is it? This is a very important question for my kids. And based on these input data, the child will make a decision. Then my job as a parent is to give feedback on their decision. I don't know what decision they're going to make when they do this for the first time. But when I end up after the fact, after they've give, made the decision, I can give them feedback. Now the output is going to come out and the uh, uh, process What's happening in their brain, if I'm to model it, it will look something like this. They will take each of this input and some input will gain more weight and some input will be, will, will be taken into account with less weight. And there will be different types of biases de depending on which part of the brain is processing this information. And all of it will be collected together and result in an output. So, what the neural network is doing is mapping between input vector and an output decision. It's a function that maps from input to output, data to decision. Now, how does the training work? Like I give feedback to my children, oh, you shouldn't have eaten that. Um, you can give the data feedback to the neural network based on your label. So if some of the data was okay to eat and some are not okay to eat, that's, you are going to look at the difference between the output that came out of the neural network and the label. And you try to minimize that difference, the distance between desired output and the actual output. And through this feedback and walking down the gradient descent of all the parameters in the neural network, those are the weights and biases, Neural network learns eventually to make the right decision, just like um, I, my, my you know, older kid at least learned eventually to make the right decision. Younger kids still working on it. So that, then our task is, can we train neural network to recognize the best hypothesis associated with data? It started with um, developing training data because there is no, not enough training data. So we develop a theory guided model for density wave, which has uh, phase uh, amplitude fluctuations, phase fluctuations, as well as topological defects. And we formulated different categories, different hypotheses. Um, 
three of these are associated with uh, incommensurate periodicity motif, uh, and one is associated with a uh, commensurate motif. And this is the outcome of uh, part of the analysis. For this paper, we've analyzed data that's been accumulated over a whole decade, a large volume of data. We've looked at every single data set from uh, Seamus's group that have been, they have been accumulating. And the conclusion that came out of that very comprehensive analysis is that as you change the energy scale, um, as you go above certain energy scale, one of the four options starts to really dominate. And the option that starts to dominate is in a particular one of the two directions, X versus Y. And that's a re recurring pattern. And that's captured in this plot where you see the confidence new networks assess, uh, assessment um, is really uh, reaching for this category two, which is the uh, commensurate outcome. The doping dependence also shows that entire underdoped range is really best described by commensurate order. So based on this, we have um, taken data that looks like this and compared two types of hypothesis, momentum space, weak coupling driven momentum space uh, based picture versus strong coupling driven real space uh, dominating picture. And uh, our conclusion is that it's really the uh, unidirectional lattice commensurate period four motifs best, best describe the data. But we have left one thing out in that study. We had a very simple neural network. It's a neural network that's uh, probably uh, as simple as it can get. Uh, so uh, shallow neural network with a wide, uh, with a, a single hidden layer. We still don't know, although it is simple, we don't know what the neural network learned. So we were really um, interested in trying to uh, pursue being able to interpret what the neural network learned. And that got us to this preprint. Now the data format that we studied here is a type of projected measurements on quantum gas microscopy, where uh, the optical lattice is formed and atoms are loaded and um, uh, the system is set so that it will be modeling the uh, Hubbard model. And measurements are projective like Stringer like measurement taking the silver atom of up spin or down spin. Uh, now we have more multiple sort of qubit degree of freedom here. But from the data perspective, these are different images. It, these are images taken from projected measurements. And there are three channels up, spin up, spin down, and hole. So what we did was to um, rethink about very widely used convolutional neural network. Convolutional neural network is a more complex version of this function modeler that I described earlier. What I described earlier was the simply connected, a fully connected, a shallow neural network. But convolutional neural network is what's widely used for image recognition, um, your facial recognition and, and so on. Uh, it's got more parameters, it's more expressible. But one of the things that it does is to learn a filter what's called convolutional filter. So this filter moves around the image data. Um, this particular filter would convolve with it, convolute it with this image data to give us a convolution map. And this convolution map can pick out from the data aspects that are um, highlighted by a given filter. And this filter is something that is being learned. After forming the convolution map, there is a second step, which is to use the nonlinearity, like the neuron firing. Nonlinearity gives a huge boost in expressibility of the neural network. But it's also what makes it very difficult to interpret what happened, because you put in something into nonlinear function, and it's hard to know what went in from the other end of the nonlinear function. So what we decided to do was to unpack this nonlinear step and really tame that nonlinear step. That's what the correlation convolutional neural network does, CCNN. We do the usual convolution, 
And then instead of putting it through a generic uh, nonlinear function as rectified linear or sigmoid, we take polynomials. And we decide through training what order of polynomial is uh, sufficient to capture what's going on in the data. And then that goes, uh, then, and that's collected and that goes into the decision-making step. Um, and uh, for the particular objective was uh, studying now the model, uh, simulated model of the Hubbard model, which is also often discussed in the context of cube rates. The experimental system of this code that STM was done is a complicated system. And you, it, you can only, um, in any kind of somewhat theoretical analysis, you can only hope to get capture uh, salient aspects of it. So an alternative approach to trying to look at experimental data and form sort of a simpler manageable model is to think of what is a possibly the simplest model and see if we can actually simulate that model. And that's the effort of this quantum gas microscopy and cold atom simulation. And they had two hypotheses. We had two hypotheses that we want to discern. Uh, one was this idea of geometric string. That is when you put a hole, as the, as the hole moves, it leaves a wake of long bonds behind. Or pi flux theory, which says um, you have a whole superposition of singlets that are uh, around in the system and the holes are moving around. And the trouble was that each of these could be a possi possible outcome from a half filling, uh, lightly doping uh, away from half filling. And it's hard to know by just looking at the images what to look at. Moreover, each point in phase space is associated with lots and lots of the uh, projective measurements. Each projective measurements are different. They are a projection just like each uh, time the silver atom splits between the top and bottom for the uh, strong girl like measurement uh, experiment, each time instances are different, you have to look at the whole collection to see that there is a two dimensional Hilbert space and what the nature of it is. Similarly, we have a whole lot of projective measurements and how can we assess from the entirety of it what is going on is a, is a challenge. In order to interpret what uh, my student Ko figured out is that what we can do is to do, use the regularization path analysis, which is to say that initially on the left-hand side of these graphs, initially we discourage uh, the uh, neural network from actually making decisions based using any of the inputs. So initially it's making decisions randomly. So its accuracy is very low because we we penalize against using any inputs. And then we gradually allow using inputs and we see which one of the inputs does it use first to get the best performance with the, under the constraint of us penalizing using any of the inputs. And the first thing that are being picked up are this fourth order of those uh, convolutions, which gave us the immediate uh, insight that, oh, it's the four pixel relations that are serving as a dis distinguishable features. Then combining the learned filter to the fact that it's a fourth order correlator. So this is one of the filters that was learned. And now we make use of the fact that it's the fourth order that mattered. Then we look for four pixel combination of this filter from the three channels. And these are all four pixel combinations that came out of the filter that was highlighted for the geometric string versus the uh, pi flux. And then we look at these filters and then we can decide whether this makes sense to us. And this is the test of interpretation. And we realize, oh, this filter that was associated with geometric string produces these motifs. And then we can look at what they can together do and realize that, oh, these motifs would be able to give us this wake behind the hole. This, this pattern is over here. This pattern with one hole at the corner and one uh, spin opposite the other two is right here. 
So we can see indeed what the neural network learned is something that makes sense to us as the right kind of thing to have learned. So this is a whole process of using this interpretable com uh, convolutional correlation convolutional neural network or CCNN. And uh, we're confident that this approach can be generally broadly useful for any image like data. Now I wanna switch gears and talk about unsupervised machine learning of large volume um, diffraction data or any uh, sort of scattering type data. This work was spearheaded by my former student, Jordan Vendely. We have a big group of collaboration. Really, uh, this wouldn't have happened without um, our young people up here with different background physics, uh, machine learning, computer science, uh, theorists, computer scientists, and experimentalists. Um, they were brave enough to try to learn very different languages and try to work with each other. And that's what was really necessary for this to be possible. So what kind of things do we want to learn from uh, X-ray diffraction? If we are to start from a uh, uh, ordered, uh, fully symmetric, uh, one-dimensional crystal as this, in th this kind of real space pattern will result in this kind of, this uh, diffraction intensities. Bragg peaks at uh, integer positions, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. The height of Bragg peaks are different showing that there is a form factor associated with the unit cell having two sites. A charge order uh, that results in larger unit cell, such as period two in this case, would introduce new sublattice peaks. These new satellite peaks will signal that the unit cell has now enlarged. Now, this form factor tells us more about what precise way in which the unit cell has enlarged. But in order to go from this side to this side, that's the reverse problem, requires being able to see what happens across the uh, several Brillouin zones. Another type of order is intra-unit cell order, which does not change the unit cell size. So unit cell remains to be the same size as the original unit cell. But now you notice all the atoms moved in a way that now there is uh, inversion symmetry lacking and there is a distortion. This distortion is only reflected through the uh, form factors in the Bragg peaks because the periodicity didn't change. There is no new super lattice peak showing up. And this can be generally hard to detect if the distortions are small. Finally, much even harder to assess is fluctuations. Fluctuations give rise to diffuse signal. And uh, until now, diffuse signals are separately studied from any structural signal, bringing, being able to bring them together and look at the whole data comprehensively has not been possible just because of the volume of the data and the different modality of analyzing the uh, structure compared to the fluctuations. So with this volume of data, uh, what can we do? This is kind of uh, a dilemma of the riches, like too much of goodness is uh, making it difficult. I've, uh, as a parent in pandemic, uh, I've experienced different kind of dilemma of riches. Just too many of those, of those Lego pieces in one big bin and uh, frequently asked for a net needed piece, um, some needed rare piece, you quickly learn what you do not want to do is to pick up one piece at a time and inspect and drop. Because if the piece is rare, the likelihood of you picking the right piece in the first shot is low by definition. And our brain is just really not um, developed for being able to hold attention on a mundane task that is repetitive. It just doesn't really work. We would miss what's right in front of us just because we got tired of that whole exercise. What is a much more effective approach, we quickly figured out was to sort. 
um, if the piece under uh, piece that is, is being asked for that we are after is has a particular color, we'll sort by color. If the piece has a particular shape, we'll sort by shape. Uh, and once you've sorted and you're after yellow color, you can tackle a lot smaller bin and you can sort once again if you have more information. So that was a lesson from pandemic parenting. How can I apply this to x-ray data? The trouble is what would be my sorting criteria? I learned that sorting is a good idea um, and it's something that can be automated. But what would be a criteria? Nobody told us what a good criteria would be. We wanted this to be uh, versatile, generalizable, and robust. And so we wanted to hang on to something simple, something like uh, Helmholtz free energy. How minimizing free energy is how is a principle of understanding phases. So what this for little formula tells us is Hamiltonian or interaction, something intrinsic about system enters in energy. Uh, entropy is the desire for the second uh, law of thermodynamics, desire for the disorder, and entropy is promoted by temperature. So temperature balances between what the system intrinsically interaction wants to do versus what the entropy wants to do. Therefore, if we look at the, all the intensities at all the Q points in the reciprocal space as a function of temperature, and we look at the whole series of temperature for every single position in the reciprocal space, we will be able to use, we'll be able to learn what type of different um, temperature dependent trends are existent in the data and simultaneously use what we are learning to sort the data. And that's the approach that we are using. That's uh, X-tech, uh, X-ray temperature clustering. So can we just see that? This is what the raw data looks like. Uh, until we developed X-tech, nobody thought to look at the temperature series and probably for a good reason, because looking at this temperature series of all data, it does not give us a whole lot of insight. There is noise at very large scales, and the dynamic range of the signal is huge. Now, can we go from this to uh, automated sor sorting that our um, home artificial intelligence devices can do? They can take signal from two speakers or multiple speakers and sort into different speakers and listen to just the speaker that is supposed to listen to. And we use a very rudimentary algorithm for that task. Uh, called Gaussian mixture model. Another thing we wanted to do was to be able to connect from zone to zone. And we didn't want to treat individual um, reciprocal space points as totally independent because obviously nearby points are related. And bringing that connection nearby points being related was what was used in this self-driving car, uh, uh, algorithm for self-driving car to use the camera information with the RIDAR information, which is rarer, but more accurate, much more prevalent, but less accurate. By being able to connect the two, they were able to get, get much better uh, detection of the uh, computer vision. So how does Gaussian mixture model works? You take the series temp data temperature series, that is take the intensity at every point in Q as a function of temperature. So you have a whole string of numbers. And we try to model that to be coming from a whole uh, collection of Gaussians. So this is a Gaussian here, with, which has mean and variance. And um, we assume there are multiple high dimensional Gaussians in, at play. So the weight between different high dimensional Gaussians is this pi. These are hyperparameters that are learned the weight and the mean and variance. We are trying to learn a representation of the data. And by learning the representation, we're going to cluster. So how does this work for uh, charge density wave? Uh, we can take data like this and cluster into this. Now, this is not made up. This is what's rep representing the actual data. And once we see this representation of the data, 
we can recognize, oh, wow, this cluster, it has ordering. This is the order parameter because of look at how it behaves as a function of temperature. This cluster is the background noise. And then we can interpret what this learning means to us physicists by looking at where the clusters came from. All the blue cluster came from these uh, locations and all the yellow clusters came from these locations. And nearby uh, Q points are behaving together as a group because of the label smoothing we used inspired by the computer vision. What about, and this allows us to map out the whole quantum phase diagram uh, by inspecting uh, hundreds of gigabytes of data from four different samples. 10 minutes, hundreds of gigabytes uh, processed in 10 minutes. Now in remaining little bit of time, I wanna talk about intra-unit cell order and fluctuations in cadmium renate. Cadmium renate is a pyrochlor metal. Um, it goes through several different phases. This transition between phase one and phase two is particularly remarkable. There's a huge um, signal, very dramatic change in specific heat, but any, any sense of displacement measured from structural refinement are very small. So big signal and small displacement made uh, various researchers suspect that perhaps it's not just the atoms, but it's the electrons are at play. In particular, this is 5D oxide. Uh, there are D electrons in renins. Ordering of this phase two further became a, a point of debate when uh, second harmonic generation measurement pointed uh, at uh, the possibility of what's been long thought to be the description of this phase, the uh, E order parameter to be a secondary order parameter and rather primary being T3 order parameter. These two order parameter candidates differ in multiple ways. One of the way in which they differ is that EU is uh, a EU order parameter forms a two-dimensional representation. When you have a two-dimensional order parameter like XY model as opposed to Ising model. So here the basis for my two-dimensional representation is I4122 and I4 bar M2 for this EU representation. So indeed, if the system is forming this order parameter, uh, which has this two dimensional structure, then you should be able to see Goldstone mode fluctuations, even if a slight anisotropy picked this order uh, structure. So being able to detect a, a Goldstone mode while detecting all the uh, signals associated with uh, the, the distortions would be able to, to nail the answer. So for this, we looked at about eight terabytes of data. Again, it takes about 10, 15 minutes. Um, I've been tempted to run the demo of you know, loading data and, and just getting the answer. If I do a one hour Zoom session meeting, not a talk, we can actually do it. We can do the analysis live. And the ambition is to be able to put these tools at synchrotrons, at the experimental, uh, at the fingertip of experimentalists so that analysis can be done right there live. So what do we get when we look at the clustering result? We found the two clusters one behaving this way and one behaving that way. These are the clusters that are associated with ordering. So for, for clarity, I'm only showing the uh, clusters associated with the uh, symmetry breaking. In this case, there is no uh, unicell size change, but with the change in the symmetry, there are new Bragg peaks that become allowed uh, due to change in the symmetry. What was symmetry forbidden at high, high temperature cubic phase become allowed in the lower temperature phase, phase two. So now um, the, the interpretation, we've got this clustering result. We look at where they came from and look at this. This is, this is actually data. This is not drawn by hand. And you look, you see this beautiful regularity. There is a selection rule associated with this type of peak and this type of peak. One peak 
they grow together. We, we fit the critical exponent. They grow together. Critical exponent is very close to 0.25. But once in the phase, the intensity of one kind of flattens out, the other keeps growing. And the selection rule tells us all the yellow peaks have this structure, HKL. There's got to be a way to make sense out of this. So this is when the human researcher gets engaged. This is this is as far as neural uh, machine learning can go. This our X tech goes only this far. But when we see something amazing like this, we start thinking, and that takes more time. We were thinking, trying to understand this for about two months, and then we eventually realized, oh, this is telling us about the Z displacement. Z displacement of rhenium's being opposite of Z displacement of cadmiums and being the same uh, magnitude. That's the only way you can suppress this. Now, um, I talked about fluctuations. We then opened up um, our analysis to instead of doing the labels, enforcing label smoothing to treat all the vicinity of Bragg peaks together, we now open up uh, the Bragg peak and let individual Q points be separately tracked. And this is what we found. The dashed line is uh, looking at the, with the uh, label smoothing on, which gives us a simpler picture, which we call X tech S for um, smoothed. Um, and X tech D is for detail if we look at the, diff the diffuse signal separately. So we take that same data and now we do X tech D. X tech D gave us, uh, told us that the ordering signal, uh, just like the, the peaks, uh, the, the diffuse region also have showed two different behaviors. And we can now sort which part, which vicinity give diffuse peaks of this cluster, which vicinity gives diffuse peaks of this cluster. And you see the same pattern between the order parameter, the center of the peaks, which dominates any peak averaging, and the diffuse peaks. There is a pattern, same pattern showing up. And um, we could initially, uh, my colleagues had difficulty uh, accepting this because it just it's not it's not the mode that people are used to thinking like. What do you mean the center of peak behaving differently from the, the diffused region? When you look at the raw data though, this is the raw data making this cut and you clearly see how the diffused region of one type of Bragg peaks show extended uh, diffuse intensity while diffused region of another type of, uh, of Bragg peaks show very little activity. So what is this uh, associated with the diffuse trajectory? Once again, human researcher gets involved and we try to understand this representative diffuse trajectory. Uh, Ungar, and uh, we were able sorry to, to- Sorry to interrupt. If you, uh, it, it'll be great if you could uh, uh, wrap up in a couple of minutes. So we have some- Yes, I'm almost done. Yeah. Right, yeah. So uh, what we were able to realize was that this red region where, which was reflecting this um, Z displacement between cadmium and rhenium and the active involvement of rhenium in that, in those same uh, displacement, there is also the Goldstone mode fluctuation. So to get this diffuse trajectory temperature dependence uh, near the transition is the critical fluctuation, but this sharp peak near the lower transition is only understandable. It's um, totally dominated by the Goldstone mode. So we indeed found the evidence of Goldstone mode and we really uh, were able to nail that the structure and the nature of transition of this cadmium renate and highlight the important role renium is playing, which is again indicating important the involvement of electrons and possible spindematic phase. So in summary, I talked about supervised machine learning used for hypothesis tests, or really trying to tip the balance between different theoretical ideas um, and uh, determine order parameter symmetries and unsupervised machine learning for uh, large volume data. And before I finish, um, I just want to uh, say a few things about what is the role of machine learning 
in our um, thinking our uh, and you know for human when when I one time I gave a talk at, uh, at one of uh, institutions and uh, one person in the audience said you know machine learning is only ever good for um, artificial intelligence is only good for automation it's going to take the job away this is the jacquard loom it was the first programmable machine it it's uh, this this is the code that's going into the loom. Until the invention of Jacquard loom, the pattern of these textiles had to be human designed. And that's why carpets were very, very expensive. Most people, you know, average people couldn't afford uh, something that requires so much human labor. But invention of Jacquard loom made pattern fabric available to everybody. Now, most people saw this machine and thought, well, yeah, that's a machine. Um, Ada Lovelace, who first who was the first person to ever think of programming a computer, looked at this and thought, oh, this is how we can program a computer. We can use punch cards to give to a computer and make it follow a sequence of actions and do a big computation. And although she didn't get to implement this, the history continued and we had a, a phase where uh, punch cards were used. So here's where I want to end. Um, machines are coming and machines are here and it is our choice to make to learn to use them like these group of human computers who then became a pro became programmers instead of uh, you know losing their jobs when they started to go NASA started to go from human computers crunching numbers to computer crunching numbers they needed somebody to program. Same ways, um, there are algorithms and tools that are available and, and rapidly developing. And I think it really makes sense for uh, us to learn to use it, especially our students uh, who are you know, growing up so naturally surrounded by artificial intelligence. They take all this much more naturally. What I found in my couple of years of, uh, of this adventure is that the younger the student is, the quicker they are in making making progress and they just you know think much more they connect much more naturally so um yeah and, and so that's that's my closing message and thank you for your attention i'm done thank you so much Angar, for the nice really nice talk um we can take a, a few a quick questions any questions from audience You can just unmute yourself and ask questions. So, so Angar, so like in general speaking, uh, if we want to uh, discover some uh, new uh, quantum phase of matter, so we uh, would it use this uh, unsupervised uh, uh, machine learning technique? Yes, I think for discovery, we want to use unsupervised machine learning. Mm, but if we want to test uh, existing models, uh, then we want right. to supervise. Okay. Right. Gotcha. Right. Mm. Okay, Harsh, I see you have a question. Yeah, I guess I had a couple of related questions. The first is I think I missed something in the early part of your talk. Maybe I should go back and read the mm -hmm. paper. But you, you, it was a classifying problem. The first one, when you were looking mm -hmm. at the tunneling data, you had these four different mm -hmm. possible images. Right. Yeah. So I wasn't clear what the training data on that was because you don't actually mm -hmm. know the answer. Yeah. Right, right. So let me go. Uh, oh, I, I, I'm sorry to do this. I don't like it when other people do it. But I think this will be actually fastest. Almost there. Yeah, I went fast there. I, I was kind of quick there. Um, so these training data were trained based on theoretical model for charge density wave, sort of idealized model. So our model of charge density wave is it is periodic. So, uh, you know, it's periodic with a representative periodicity, QC. And we chose four different representative periodicities as a uh, as a identity of a given candidate. So these four categories have representative periodicities. And we chose those periodicities 
based on when we look at the Fourier transform, we see this broad weight and we kind of try to represent all the different periodicities that could be covered under the weight. And they are, so if I go back to the Fourier transform, they are generally around, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. So here, this, this vicinity is what we're trying to capture. Um, that's around here. So uh, we, we picked four positions in the in four periodicities or four, four wave numbers that would be that could be underneath this because it's not obvious which would have been the real peak center. The reason why it's so jagged is because patterns are very real space sharp. So what's sharp in real space gives kind of broad noise in momentum space. There is very clearly sharp motifs. It's more like tile rather than a wave in this picture. And we are trying to capture what's the tile here? What's the shape of the tile? What's the periodicity of the tile? So we represent the different tile candidates um, with these four categories. And when we simulate this, it doesn't look quite like experimental data. The data is much more noisier and it's much more complex. Um, but when we simulate this, we try to capture uh, different types of uh, fluctuations and noise sources. So we capture the noise in the phase of the charge modulation, noise in the amplitude of the modulation, and noise due to topological defects. And that was our training data. And I think your question is getting to the heart of the difficulties, the, the key challenges of the supervised learning and hypothesis testing when it comes to uh, analyzing uh, quantum matter data. It's that we don't have a lot of training data. So we all, when we try to attempt this, we often rely on uh, simulated data, but simulations are always coming from some sort of idea. So the, uh, that idea that's underlying the simulation is the identity of the simulated data. And there is a challenge of can the model that's machine learning model trained on the simulated data learn, pick up the right kind of features in the experimental data. And that's where the interpretation enters. So I guess there was a sort of related follow-up to the second part where you, um... You know, you figured out what it was that the machine was doing. It was looking for this wave mm -hmm. or not looking for it. Once you know that, of mm -hmm. course, you can probably write a special purpose program to very quickly, you know, do the same analysis. Right, itself. right, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that's the, that's the point. We want to be able to figure out what's the, what are the key features. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, human eye is really good at motif recognition. And I think that's why, like, going back to the civilizations, we, people would make piles and pattern things, we are, it, it really jumps out at human uh, visual impression. The problem is you cannot make it objective. You cannot trans, transfer your impression to another person's impression because beyond the visual impression is the process of processing that visual impression. And we all have bias and we have the languages we use. And I see one thing, my friend sees something else in the data, although we see the same data. So using the, uh, this kind of image recognition tools can take that subjectivity somewhat out of the picture. Thank you, that was very nice. Thank okay. you. Great, so I think we are a little over time. So I suggest to uh, close the formal session and stop recording. So if you're still interested, we can stay a little longer uh, with NR so we can uh, have an informal discussion. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. <laughs>